Hi. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk today about how philosophy can improve your life. Um, and it's only half an hour, so we're probably not going to cover like literally everything. But let's try and give you like a flavour of um, how I think it can be useful. Let's start with this question: What's philosophy for? I mean, sometimes people ask this, um, and it is kind of baffling because, like, what, what do you mean, what's it for? Um, it's basically a toolbox. You know, sometimes when we um, talk at, you know, philosophy lectures, talk at open days to A-level students, um, and you'll sometimes get this question: You know, what is what is philosophy? What what, what do you do with it? Um, and it's kind of a toolbox. It's a set of um, strategies and tools and techniques that you can use to gain clarity about um, any sort of issue really, you know, whatever you choose to apply it to. So here are a few, I mean, a, a non-exhaustive list of um, what philosophy can be good for. So identifying and articulating hidden assumptions. I used to teach a logic class to undergraduates, and um, undergraduates don't tend to like logic. It's got too many symbols in it, and they kind of came to do an arts degree, and they kind of end up like, what, what the hell are you giving me? I didn't choose to do maths. Um, so I used to kind of try and sell it to them early on by sort of saying, like, this, makes, this is going to make you really good at winning arguments with people. Now, even if you never use it again, if you're just in a debate with somebody about whatever it might be, politics, whatever, there's some techniques I'm going to teach you that will help you dismantle your opponents. Or, I mean, probably not actual opponents, not like enemies, but you know, whoever you're talking to. Sort of work out where the flaws are in their arguments. Um, sort of hone in your objections on the actual problems with what they're saying um, and build your case. Um, and one issue with, you know, the, the, reason I've, the reason I've used the word hidden there is that often when you're debating with somebody, um, they will be building an argument based on assumptions that they might not even realize they have. And sometimes that's okay. You know, uh, sometimes you might be arguing with somebody and, and you both, um, you know, say you're arguing about politics and you, you both are working with an assumption that equality is important, something like that. I mean, that seems important. And acceptable, right? But, but you might not realize you're doing it. And sometimes people do that with um, problematic assumptions as well. Spotting dodgy reasoning, I mean, kind of hopefully self-explanatory. Um, asking why ad infinitum. So philosophers are a bit like toddlers in this respect. Um, and it's kind of socially unacceptable. You know, if somebody's saying something to you and you just, you might ask why once, but you're not going to keep on doing that. Um, unless you're a philosopher. And it, it, is, it is actually a useful technique, right? Because every time you ask why, you get a little bit deeper into um, the, the foundational justifying claims um, that underpin what, what somebody's claiming. So philosophers aren't afraid to do that. Um, and analogies, uh, arguing by analogy is a really important philosophical technique. Um, and it's basically a, a way of saying, um, you know, this is what we think about this issue. Um, we can compare it to the way that we're thinking about this other issue and if they're kind of similar in what looks like to be relevant respects then you should be treating them similarly. So just an example there, um, you might have heard of the, um, the watchmaker argument for the existence of God. Um, this is something that Richard Dawkins talks about in his blind watchmaker um, argument um, where the, the reasoning goes that suppose you find a watch in the middle of a field um, and it's you know it's it's it works fine. It's it's it, it looks like a watch. It functions like a watch. Um, how would you assume that it's got there? And the answer you're supposed to come up with is somebody's put somebody's designed this. It hasn't just kind of popped up there by accident. There's a designer behind it. And so this is supposed to be an analogy for the world. You know, the world is a kind of complex and well-ordered system. Um, and so it's kind of like the watch. You don't just assume that it's popped up by itself. You assume that somebody's created it. So um, the, uh, if that argument is successful, you're supposed to end up believing in God. Here's zooming out a bit. This is what, we, this is what philosophers do. It's kind of looking under the bonnet of reality, or looking under the hood of reality if you're an American. Um, it's just a sort of general a way of 
uh, gaining a better understanding of the world around us. Um, what part of reality you're looking at depends on what you're interested in. You can examine anything you like, really, with um, philosophical techniques. But I'm going to give you a bit of my own story. Um, so when I started out, uh, I mean, I've been a philosopher kind of most of my adult life. I've had quite a, quite a boring career. I started out 18 doing a, a, a philosophy degree. And then I just carried on. And I kind of went into IT for a few years. And that was a bad idea. But then I came back to philosophy. And that's kind of the way it's been ever since. And I was always sort of interested, especially early on, in um, quite kind of abstract issues, like um, things to do with our experience of time. Um, it was like, you know, is, is backwards causation in theory possible? You know, could future events cause earlier events? Um, what's a person? You know, what makes you the same person now that you were when you were six years old? And so on. Um, free will, all, all this sort of stuff. Um, and the reason I'm saying that's quite abstract is because it's um, philosophers are arguing about it, and a hundred years from now, they're probably still going to be we are probably still going to be arguing about it. Right? There's nothing really that's kind of there's no kind of resolution. Um, you're not going to make a discovery that's going to kind of oh right okay that's what free will is. Um, as I've as the years have ticked by, I've become sort of increasingly interested in more applied issues. So um, the stuff that just kind of matters in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so I kind of moved quite slowly into applied ethics, um, philosophy of medicine, um, philosophy of mental health and psychiatry, and so on. Um, I more recently got interested in philosophy of language. Um, and more recently still, so like the kind of uh, getting more and more applied. Um, a couple of years ago, it occurred to me that actually philosophy could be a really useful tool in just helping people live their lives. Just kind of helping people be happier, success, more successful, and so on. And none of this is particularly new. These are th th this kind of approach is quite ancient. You know, if you read sort of people like Aristotle, um, one of the driving questions there is sort of how can we live better lives? Um, so I have sort of gradually, I've kind of, I tend to write more for general audiences these days because um, it tends to be kind of the public in general who's kind of interested in, um, oh God, you know, sort of how, how can I use social media in a healthy way? Um, how should I think about the friends I've made online? This, this sort of stuff, rather than sort of academic philosophers. Most recently, I've started a podcast. I, don't really want to kind of plug <laughs> plug it here, but just like a sort of, I guess, like to give you a to give you an idea of the the journey I've taken. Like this is just like a Apple Podcast screenshot of some of the most recent episodes. So I'm sort of trying to apply philosophy to um, the sorts of problems that people grapple with every day. So that's the kind of um, that's been what's been going on with me, and I'm gonna get, gonna give you a little taste of. Um, a way that you could use philosophy, like kind of right now, to start um, being happier and living better lives. So I'm going to focus on like a, an example because I'm not going to talk about everything. Um, but here's a familiar problem. Um, I do quite a bit of coaching these days, and um, I am kind of telling you about a problem that comes up again and again with people that I see. Um, we don't see the world as it really is. Most of the time, we don't think about that. You think like, you know, the objects you see in the world are really there, that you're seeing them kind of accurately as they, as they would be if you weren't there observing them at all. You know, we don't tend to think that the world we observe differ, differs in any significant way from the way that we perceive it. But actually, that's wrong. And, and there's sort of a, a tradition of hundreds of years, actually, of philosophers telling you exactly why that's wrong. Um, I'm not particularly interested in perception here. I'm interested in the beliefs that we hold about ourselves. Because just as your, your senses filter the world around you, um, the beliefs that you hold about yourself do the same. And we don't always realize that. Because you, you, you might not realize that you hold the beliefs that, that do this. So what do I mean? I mean, deeply held beliefs, right? These kind of are like sort of core beliefs that you've probably had since childhood, right? The sort of things that you might 
if you wanted to uncover them, you might have to go to psych th psychotherapy, something like that. Um, so you might not be able to kind of, you know, someone to, to ask you, like, like, what are your fundamental beliefs, the ones that kind of govern your decisions and your choices as you go through the world? You might have to think hard about it and you still might not come up with an answer. But they do show up in the choices you make. And by reflecting on the choices you make and the choices you don't make, um, this can kind of give you an insight into the sorts of beliefs that are guiding you here. So I'm going to focus on some examples. Um, I tried to choose some examples that I hope, you know, lots of us can relate to. But, you know, as I'm going through it, maybe you can sort of reflect and think of, um, of some examples from your own life. So suppose this happens. You apply for a job and you get rejected. So you feel bad. Um, what else do you think about it? Um, well, here's what lots of people think if you get rejected from a job. This is evidence that I'm not good enough. Another example. You do something at work and your boss doesn't say anything positive about it. So you might think, oh, she thinks what I've done is rubbish. Final example, I promise. Your friend doesn't use as many happy emojis as usual in her text message. So you think, she's annoyed with me. Okay, so there's these kind of negative judgments that are that we make just as we go through life, you know, sort of just the way somebody might respond to us or a decision that we're confronted with or just somebody's manner. You know, we're sort of constantly drawing these little conclusions about what these things that we encounter mean. And here is where we kind of get an insight into what some of the core beliefs that filter our reality might be. So we have, I'm not good enough. You get rejected from a job and you can, if you conclude that you're not good enough as a result of that, that's only something that you're going to conclude if you already believe that, right? If you think you're fantastic and you get rejected from a job, so it's kind of like, oh, those, those idiots, they just don't recognize my immense worth or, or something like that. These are beliefs that you hold before this stuff happens and then when certain things happen, you kind of interpret those happenings through the lens of these beliefs. And you think you're seeing evidence for them, but you're not really. Now, here's a problem with those beliefs, in case you haven't spotted already <laughs> there's a problem with those beliefs. They're foundational, right? They're kind of, they kind of make up who you are. And that means that they, you hold them and you kind of build other stuff on them. And what you build on them is unsupported because those beliefs are wrong, or at least they're unjustified. What might you build, if you believe I'm not good enough, or I'm incompetent, or people don't like me, what sort of things might you build? Like, what am I talking about when I talk, talk about build, building on those beliefs? Well, they determine the choices you might make. You know, if you think you're not good enough, then maybe there's certain opportunities that will come up that you could go for, but which you decide not to. You know, I won't go for that promotion because I'm not good enough. Or this person's invited me to their dinner party, but I know they don't like me really, and no, nor does everybody else, so I'm going to turn it down, etc. Now, in case that's still too abstract, think of, imagine somebody else being told, imagine, imagine knowing somebody who you love, who you're close to, and imagine they're in a relationship with a partner who says these sorts of things to you. You know, they're married to somebody who says to them things like, you're not good enough, or you're incompetent, or nobody likes you. I mean, that would seem... We say these sorts of things to ourselves and think that there's nothing wrong with it, right? But then when we imagine it said to somebody that we love, then we might see the problem. And perhaps you can get an intuitive grasp there of the sort of problems that those, those sorts of things might cause in, in that person's life. So here's like philosophy to the rescue. Uh, there's some techniques from philosophy that you can use here. Um, one is to find the beliefs in the first place to be open and curious about what those beliefs might be that kind of guide the way we move through the world and to be open to rejecting them if they turn out not to be justified. Now, this is what Descartes did in the 17th century. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.